Before we dive into the lessons, I'd like to tell you something that is very unique about this course. In this course, you will not only learn how to write excellent PHP codes, you also have deep understanding of programming concepts. These concepts can be applied to any other programming language. And trust me, this course is meant for an absolute beginner or anyone who likes to increase his understanding of programming concepts. Now, let me walk you through the content of the course. In the first lesson, you will learn about variables and data types. You will learn how to create variables, how to read variables, and how to update variables. You also learn the difference between variables and constants. And after this, you will learn how to write intelligent codes by the use of branching strategy. After this, you will learn how to make your code to run repetitively by the use of for and while loop. And after this, you will learn the very powerful data structure of PHP, and that is Array. You will work extensively with Array and you will write a lot of examples. After Array, you will learn how to write functions in PHP. You will be able to write functions that meet best programming practices. And after this, you will learn how to write a crash-free code by handling all exceptions. After this, you will learn file management in PHP. You will be able to create a file, to read data from a file, to update a file, and you also learn how to safely delete a file. And lastly, you will put a lot of what you've learned in previous lessons together in validating and processing form. You've heard a lot about this course. It is time to begin the journey. Let's get started. For this course, we need to download some packages. And the first one is to download Sublime Text. And that should be the ID he will be using for this course. I mean the ID that is the environment wherein we'll be writing our codes. And since we'll be running our codes on a local machine, we need to download something to serve as a server on our local machine. For this tutorial, we'll be using AMPS. So we also have some other alternatives like ZAMP and you can also download WAMP. But we'll tell you how to download Sublime Text and AMPS. So for Sublime Text, let us visit the website. So just type Sublime Text download so you have this so if you are on windows you need to download this and this is for windows 64 and this is for linux well since i'm on mac i will download this so this download may take some time so we finish download this sublime text so we just need to install so you can go to the folder and click on this so you can now move the sublime text into the application. So since I already have a sublime text application, in my case, I can just keep both. So let us launch the application. So and here we have, we've successfully installed our sublime text. So you can see, so this will be used for writing our codes. So let's talk about the second application, which is AMPS. So you can also go to the website and you have AMPS download. So this is a link to download AMPS. And uh, so this is it. So for Windows, you have to download this. And this is for Mac and this is Linux. So you can check. And if your Windows is not supporting this version, you have to click here. So since I'm on Mac, I'll be downloading this. So after finish downloading, you can install your apps. So you just click on this.
So you can move the arms into the application. So this is done so we can uh, launch our arms. So when you double click on this, so this is the application. So just click on this. So we like to allow it. Uh, so we have to go to the settings. Let's go to the security setting. So you can allow arms. So you have to enter the password and uh, with this we've launched our arms. So the Apache, PHP and MySQL are running. And if you are on Windows, you can follow this demo video. So you have arms.com demo here. Yeah. So this video is for Windows. And this is for Linux. In this tutorial, I will introduce you briefly to web development. Web development is basically the creation of web pages. According to Netcraft, there are over a billion websites in the world. Now, let us visit a very popular website and thereafter, I will explain in very high level what actually happens behind the scene. So, let us visit jumia.com.ng And this is the home page of jumia.com.ng now let us visualize what actually happens. The entire process can be divided into two sides, the clean side and the server side. The clean side resides on the user's computer and this is where the entire process begins. The user starts by typing the domain name of the website. In our own case, it was jumia.com.ng. By doing that, we are able to send a request to the server. The server gets the request, processes it, and sends the response back to the client. The response is then being formatted in a human readable format by some technologies in the client site. Some of these technologies include HTML, which is basically for structuring web pages, CSS, which is used for designing, uh, JavaScript, which increases the interactivity of web page. And on the server side, we also have a bunch of technologies we have a lot of programming languages which include PHP, Java, C Sharp, Python, Ruby, and we also have database which serve as storage engine. This course focuses on PHP as a server-side scripting language, so we dive deep into PHP. Now let us begin the journey. Now that we've installed all the required packages required to write PHP, it is time to write our first PHP code. To write PHP codes, there are four required steps. We follow the steps one after the other with their respective implementation. The first step is create and import PHP project folder. 
we'll be creating our project folder inside the www folder then we'll import our project folder in our ide that is sublime text so let us implement this the first thing is to create our project folder so in my own case i already have a folder named store but because of this course i'll be creating a new folder so let us name it first project okay so the next thing is to import this project inside my ide so i go to file open so the part is from application www and this is my project so i have first project so with this i've successfully completed the first required step so let us move to the second step the second step is create php file php file is just like any other file but with a dot php extension let us create the file in my ide i will creating a file inside my project so we have new file so to save the file i have command s on windows you have to press Control s so you name the file as let's call it home dot php because it is a php file so it's going to be stored inside this project that is my first project folder okay so with this i've completed the second step which is creation of php file the third step is write php codes there are a few things to note here before writing the code the first one is that there is an opening and closing tag for writing php You have to start your PHP code with this tag. You have the less than question mark. You have PHP, and you close it with question mark greater than. So any line of code between these is going to be executed by the browser as PHP codes. Within these tags, you can have multiple lines of codes. You can have maybe like three lines of code or more than that one other thing you have to note is that after the end of each line you have to add a semicolon after the end of this line you have to add semicolon and each line has to have a semicolon so let us write the implementation now this is my home.php file so to start the php code we have to write the opening tag which is php and the closing tag is this so all the lines of code between these is going to be executed by the browser as php code we follow the normal convention of starting any programming language and that is to print hello world on the screen to print hello world in php there is a command which is echo echo is used to print on the screen so you want to print hello world so we have echo hello world you can add an exclamation mark so we have to save the file with this, we are done with the third step. Let us move to the last step. And what do you think the last step can be? It's actually running our code. You notice that when you visit a website, the part of the URL begins with www.something. 
But since we are running our own code on a local machine, we have to begin with local host followed by the project folder. In our own case, it is first project. And lastly, the name of the file. In our case, it is home.php. So this is going to be the path to our file. So let us check this on the browser. So you have local host first project. We have slash home.php. So you can see successfully we have hello world when printed on the screen. So to confirm this, let us add another thing. Maybe let us write hello world everyone. So you have to save your file and let's go back to the browser. So you can refresh. Oh, we have hello world everyone. It shows our code is working fine. We've done a great job. In this tutorial, I'll be talking about variables and constants. In PHP and other programming languages, we deal a lot with data. Each data requires a container which holds it in the code execution. Some data changes during code execution while others remain constant. This variation in data states determines the type of container which is required to hold data. Basically, there are two types of containers. We have variables and constants. Variables are meant to hold data that changes. Y constant is meant for fixed data. In PHP, to represent a variable, you write a dollar sign plus the name of the variable. For example, a variable to hold the names of students in a class can be written as dollar name. If a name of a student is something like Adewale, then we can assign this value adewali to the container in that case what we have to do is to put an equals to sign so we are assigning adewali into the container dollar name later in the future this can change since you know this is a variable later we can have dollar name to be something like a marker So it means this is the data we are assigning to the container. For constant, it is fixed. Once it is defined, you cannot change the value again. And in PHP, it is written as define. This is the container name. And this is the value, I mean the data that is being attached to the container. For example, if you want to store the resumption date in a school, something like date. So this would be the value, I mean the data being assigned to this container. So maybe you have something like 4, 8, 2019. In that case, this is the data and this is the container. You are assigning the data into this container. Later in the future, this cannot be changed because this is a constant. Now let us visualize variables and constants using boxes. Here we have two boxes. We have an open box 
when you have a closed box. The open box represents variables and this represents constants. For the open box, you can easily put a value here, maybe a data of value 4, and later in the future, you can remove this value and assign another value 5 because this container is open. This container is a variable. In the case of a constant, once a value has been attached to it, maybe like 10, there is no way you can remove this value and there is no way you can append any other value to it again. So now that we know the difference between variables and constants, let us play around with both of them in our IDE. So let's go to the sublime text. So now we can represent variables. Let us remove the first statement. We can represent our variable dollar name to hold a value. Let's call it Adewale. And to see this value, let us use the echo statement we used in the previous class. So we want to print out Adewale. It is we are printing out anything that we have in our container, which is a variable. So we can echo dollar name. At this point, our dollar name is holding a value, Adewale. So on our screen, we should see Adewale being printed. So let's check. So we have to refresh. And we can see Adewale because we are printing the data in our variable. Let us change the data. So later on, maybe we have dollar name is now holding another value. Let's say Amaka this time around. So let's check it. Oh. We just need to refresh our browser. So you can see that our variable is now holding Amaka. Because Amaka was defined after Adewale, the last value that is being defined is what the container will hold. If we define another value, So if you have something like iShot, so let's check our browser. So you can see that it's holding iShot. But for constant, you cannot change the value. So now let us define a constant. The constant is defined as, right, define. So let's assume we have resumption date to be a constant. You know, constants are written in capital letter. We have resumption date. So this is the container. Let's assign the value. Probably we have something like this. 0, 5, 2019. So this is the resumption date. And this, since this is a line, we have semicolon so let us print what we have in our container that is the resumption date so we have echo echo now constant is this resumption date so let's check this in the browser before that let us comment this so when you comment a code, this code will not be executed. And you can see that it has different color in the IDE. So let us save it. And when we reload, we have, this is the resumption date, which is a constant. So now let us try to append another value to the constant and let's see what will happen. So let's have define for the same constant can copy so that we don't have any spelling error. So let us append another date and let's see what will happen. So maybe we have 14, we have 
so let's save and uh, print the resumption date in the browser you can see that we still have the same value here because for constant once you define them you cannot change the value so this is the difference between a variable and a constant In this tutorial, I'll be explaining if else statements. At certain positions in life, we have to take some decision. An example is after finishing the junior secondary school education. You have to decide your class in the senior secondary school. The decision is strongly based on what you like to be in the future. Basically, there are three choices. We have the science class, we have the social science, and we have the art class. A student who likes to be a medical doctor or an engineer then he has to choose science class. A student who likes to be an economist or an accountant or a business administrator then he has to choose social science and a student who likes mass communication or he likes to be a lawyer then he has to choose art class decision making is very common in software development and for this reason, a special syntax has been dedicated to it. This syntax is known as if-else statement. Now let us represent our example using the if-else statement. And this is the statement. The first condition is, if you like to be a medical doctor, then you have to choose science class. This statement here is known as condition. A condition can either be true or false. When the condition is true, then this block of code will be executed. The codes between these two curly braces. This line of codes will be executed. This can be two, three, four, ten lines of code everything between these curly braces is going to be executed this is known as block of code but if this condition is false the line of execution comes to the second condition do i like to be an accountant this is also a condition which is either true or false when it is true this is going to be executed but if it is false, the line of execution jumps here. Else if I like to be a lawyer, this is also a condition. This is also true or false. If it is true, the lines of code here will be executed. Or if it is false, then the line of execution comes here. This is a representation of our example. And the first condition is if I like to be a medical doctor, this is a condition which is either true or false. When this condition is true, it means this line of code will be executed. That is, all lines of code between the curly braces will be executed. It can be two, three lines, or multiple lines of code. And this is referred to as block of codes. If this is executed, these other conditions will be skipped. And the next line of execution will jump to this point. But if this condition is false, this will not be executed. And the point of execution jumps to this point. This is also another condition, which can be either true 
or false. If it is true, this will be executed. And the next line of execution is this point. But if this is false, this will not be executed and this will be checked. This is also another condition. This can either be true or false. If this is true, this will be executed and the code continues here. But in a case wherein all the conditions are false, you can add an else statement. Maybe you have something like nothing was chosen. This is an else statement. If all the conditions above are false, this will be executed. In this tutorial, I'll be talking about comparison operators. Comparison operators are used in conditional statements. As I mentioned in the previous tutorial, conditional statements are either true or false. Now let's talk about the operators. And the first one I like to talk about is the double equals to sign. This check for equality. At least you can check if $x is the same thing as $y. For example, checking if minus 2 is the same thing as 3. This will return false. But for minus 5 is the same thing as minus 5, this will return true. The difference between the two equality sign and one equality sign is that two equality sign checks for equality. It is used for conditional statements. But a single equality sign is an assignment statement. For example, if you have $x equals to 3. Here you are assigning 3 to this container. But if you have $x equals to 3, you are checking if $x and 3 have the same value. In this case, this is going to be true if $x also is 3. But it's going to be false if $x is not 3. So this is the difference between the two equality sign and one equality sign. Another operator is greater than. For example, if you have $x is greater than $y. For example, if you have 5 greater than 3, this is going to return true. But if you have 2 is greater than 10, this is false. So let's talk about the next operator. We also have less than. So you can check if $S is less than $Y. This is also a conditional statement. So for example, 2 is less than 3. This is going to return true. But when you have minus 2 is less than minus 10, this is going to return false. Another operator is greater or equals to. For example, when you have $x is greater or equals to $y. Minus 5 is greater or equals to 2. Minus 5 is not greater than 2. And minus 5 is not equal to 2. So this is going to return false. But if you have something like minus 3 is greater or equals to minus 3. Though minus 3 is not greater than minus 3, but minus 3 is equal to minus 3. 
So this is true. Another operator is less or equals to. You can also have dollar s is less or equals to dollar y. An example minus two is less or equals to five. This is going to return true. But when you have 10 is less or equals to something like 2, in this case, this is false. Because 10 is not less than 2, and 10 is not equals to 2. The next operator is the triple equals to sign. That is identical. It does two things. The first one is checking the value and the second thing is checking the data type. If both values and data types are the same thing, then it's going to return true. That is to check if $x and $y are identical, you have something like this. So you have 2.0. You are checking if it is identical to 2. This will return false. Although 2.0 is the same thing as 2, but this is a float, Why this is an integer. So though they have the same values, but since they have different data types, false will be returned. So you are going to have true when you have 2.0 is identical to 2.0. In this case, both values and data types are the same thing. We can negate some of these operators and conditional statements by using a negator. Negator is written as an exclamation mark. For example, if you want to negate the double equals to sign, it will be written as this. So if you want to check if $x is not equals to $y, for example, 2 is not equals to 3, this will return true. So 2 is not equals to 2, this will return false. You can also negate the triple equals to sign. So it will be written as $x is not equals to this. So it shows that this is not identical to this. For example, if you have 2.0, it's not identical to 2. This is going to be true. Because though they have the same values, but they have different data types. But 2.0 is not identical to 2.0. This is false. So we can also negate conditional statements. For example, you can negate something like $x is greater than $y. So if you have negation of 2 is greater than 3, the outcome should be you are negating 2 is greater than 3 is false. So when you negate false, you have true. Another example, maybe you have, you want to negate minus 2 is less or equals to 10. So minus 2 is less or equals to 10. So you are negating this is less or equals to 10. So this is true. So the answer will be false. There are some operators that combine two or more statements together. For example, AND, which is written as ampersand. It has a value of true if and only if all the combined statements are true. For example, if we have $A is greater than $B and $C is greater than $D. The result will be true if and only if this is true and this is true. Otherwise, we have false. For example, if this statement is true, 
and this is false, our outcome will be false. If this is false and this is true, we'll be having false. And if both of them is false, we have false here. Another operator is OR, which is written as this. The value will be true if at least one of the conditions is true. For example, as we have here, if either this is true and this is false, we'll be having true. If this is false and this is true, we'll be having true. If this is true, this is true, we'll be having true. And if this is false and this is false, we'll be having false. Here, if at least one of the conditions is true, our outcome will be true. But for here, all the conditions has to be true before you have a true value. It is time to write some codes. We have to write codes that convert a score into grade using the standard below. And I think this standard is very common amongst a lot of schools. So let us analyze the problem and try to create the conditions. The first standard is 70 to 100 is A. That is, when the score is greater or equals to 70, we have A. Or we can combine it with and the score is less or equals to 100. So although the first condition is going to cover both because for any mark that is greater or equals to 70, 100 is inclusive, so we may not add this second condition. For the second condition, the score must be greater or equals to 60 and less than Seventy, because sixty-nine point nine will still be regarded as B. So the score has to be less than seventy. And here the score should be greater or equals to fifty, and less than sixty. So all the remaining grades follow the same standard. So that is, the score must be greater or equal to this, and must be less. This is less than must be less than the number here. For here, it should be greater than or equal to forty-five, but less than fifty. For here, it has to be greater or equal to forty, but less than forty-five. And here it must be greater or equal to zero, but less than 40. So let us write the code in our ID. So we can remove everything here. Just delete everything. So let us assume we are keeping our score in this variable. So maybe let us assume the first score is something like 46. This will be used for testing purpose. But to write our code, we have the false if statement. If our score is greater than or equals to 70, then let us echo. A.
else if ask call is greater or equal to 60 and our score is less than 70. So here we are printing B. Else if this score is greater or equals to 50 and the score is less than 60. This is C. So the next line is else if the condition is dollar score is greater or equals to 45 and dollar score is less than 50. In this case, the echo D else if the other score is greater or equals to forty and dollar score is less than 45 the echo this is e else if dollar score is greater or equal to zero and dollar score is less than 40 so this is f So, let us test our code. So, for example, if the last score is 45, normally we should be having D. So, let's test it. Refresh. This is D. Let's add another value 76. This should be A. It's actually A. Any other value? Let's add something like 42, 43. So this should give us, this should be in this range E. Which is correct. We have something like 33. This should be F. So you can test with any value. So what of if I put a negative sign here, what will happen? Nothing is being echoed in the string. So you can write maybe a statement to cover any exceptional case. So this call must not be lesser than zero.
So let's check our browser. Okay. So we are right. Sort of if you have a score like 200, what will happen? This is a let us address this issue also. So in this statement here, let us have and the last call is less or equals to 100. So we need to change the statement here to cater for both limits. This call must be within 0 and 100, something like that. This call must be within the limit, something like that. So, for score equals 100, this will return false, this will return false, 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 and this will be printed out. So, let's take the browser. Okay. So, everything is working perfectly now. In this tutorial, I'll be talking about types of if else statements. There are two types of if else statements. We have exclusive and inclusive. In exclusive if else statements, there is no point of overlap between conditions. For example, if conditions are represented by circles, for two conditions, you have something like this, such that the two circles are exclusively related. There is no point of intersection between the two circles. Our last solution is a very good example of exclusive if-else statements. So let us revisit it. If you look at all the ranges, you will find out that there is no single number that falls between two ranges. If you are to represent this by circles, we'll be having six circles without any point of overlap. So this is exclusive if-else statement. And one thing you have to note in exclusive if-else statement is that there is no strict order in arranging your conditions. In our example, we started arrangement with 70 to 100. And we move down the line like this. If you start from 0 to 39 and you move up, you still have the same solution. You can even start from somewhere here in the middle. You still have the same solution in as much as you cover all the ranges. So there is no priority in making a range to come after another. But in inclusive if-else statement, there is point of overlap. You have the conditions to be something like this. There is a point of intersection between conditions. In cases like this, there is a strict rule in arranging the conditions. The conditions that falls in the overlap has to come first. So this will be the first condition to be written in our code, followed by either this or this in any order. But the point of intersection must come first. Let's look at an example. In this problem, we have to print 3 if a variable is divisible by 3 and print 5 if it is divisible by 5 and print it is divisible by 3 and 5 when it is divisible by the two numbers that is 3 and 5. So our diagram can be represented like this. There is a point of intersection that is the point wherein the number is divisible by both 3 and 5. In our if-else clause, this has to come first. 
followed by either this or this to have a correct solution. Let us check the solution. In the solution, you can see that the point of intersection is coming first in the if statement, followed by this and this. If any of these precede the point of intersection, we'll be having a wrong solution. So the note point is that for inclusive if else statement, you have to start from the point of intersection. There is a strong rule, there is a strict rule in arranging your conditions. In this tutorial, I'll be talking about switch statements. This is a switch. And what is the function of a switch? A switch is used in controlling the flow of electrons in a circuit. This may sound too high. To come to a low level language, a switch can be used for lightening a bulb. When the switch is on, the bulb will be on. And when the switch is off, the bulb goes off. We notice that this statement of ours can be represented in if else statements. We can have something like this if on bulb is on else if of bulb is off so from this statement of ours it is very clear that switch and if all statements are the same thing in programming switch and if all statements do the same thing the only difference between the two is in the syntax now let us compare the syntax of switch and if all statement this is for if else and this is for switch statements In if else statement, you continuously repeat the reference, which is dollar value, in your conditions. This is dollar value and this is dollar value. But in switch statement, you only write the reference once. When you are doing the comparison, you don't repeat the reference. You only write case and the value to compare with the reference. In this case, it is one. So case one. Is similar to having something like if dollar value is the same thing as one, and here you have case two instead of having else if dollar value is the same thing as two, the same thing as case three instead of having else if dollar value is the same thing as three, and here you have for the else statement when all these conditions are false, this is going to be executed. For switch statement, it is called default. So this default is going to run if all the three cases above are false. It is similar to else in the if else statement. In this tutorial, I will be explaining the while loop concept. Cities in developed and developing countries have constant supply of electricity. Electricity is guaranteed if there is no natural disaster or a very serious problem. This statement can be summarized as if there is no disaster or serious problem, there is supply of electricity. This statement conforms with while loop in software development. While loop has two components. The first one is a condition, and the second one is a block of code to be executed. 
it is written as while this is the condition and this is a block of code to be executed it is very similar to the if statement the if statement is if this is a condition And this is a block of code to be executed. In if statement, when this condition is true, this block of code is executed and the line of execution jumps here. But in while loop, when this condition is true, the block of code is executed and the line of execution goes back to the condition. If the condition is true again, the block of code is executed, it goes back to the condition again, and you can see that it forms a loop until the condition is false. And this is when the line of execution will jump here. This concept, another concept explained in previous tutorials, were only implemented in PHP, but they are common to all programming languages. Now that we have a good concept of while loop, let us write our statement in while loop. Our statement can be written as while there is no disaster or serious problem, this is the condition, and the block of code is there is supply of electricity. In some countries, we have this loop running for tens of years. In this tutorial, let us write some while loop codes. So the problem here is to print hello world while a condition is met. So let's go to our IDE. So let us remove the previous codes. So now let's set a value inside the variable. Let's make it two. And now we have our while loop. Why our value is greater than zero. So let us print hello world here. Echo. Hello world. And let us add the break HTML tag. So let's close the tag. So we have something like this. And after executing this code, let us reduce the value by one. So our value should be dollar value minus one. So after executing this hello world, we are reducing our value by one. So let us see how the code is going to run. For the first time, our dollar value is two. It checks this condition. Is dollar value greater than zero? This is true because two is greater than zero. This line of code will be executed. That is, hello world will be printed. Now it's going to be dollar value because dollar value minus one, which is two minus one. The answer is one. Our dollar value we have a value of one. It goes back to the condition. Dollar value is greater than zero. Now we have one greater than zero, which is true. This will be executed the second time. And here we have our dollar value to be one minus one. One minus one is zero. So the current value of dollar value is zero. So it goes back to the condition. Dollar value greater than zero. That is zero greater than zero, which is false. The next line of execution will jump out of the loop. So it means we successfully printed hello world just two times. So let's confirm that on the browser. So let's check the browser. So if you refresh, so you can see this is confirming our logic. 
we are having hello world two times let's make it four and let's check the result so this is four times and if you like you can add the value here so let us add the value and let's check the result I mean our container here the variable let us add it here so we have hello world for the first time is four three two one for the first time dollar value is four you're having four here the second time is three third time is two one for zero this line of code will not be executed because this condition is false so the line of execution jumps here so let's make it eight So let's refresh you have eight until you have one because the condition is dollar value greater than zero so can we change it to a negative value and let's see the result if this is minus one no this will not be executed at all why because even at the first case dollar value is minus one minus one is greater than zero is false so nothing will be executed in the block of code. So it jumps here. So can we change our condition? Let's make this to be less than, and let's check the result. But before checking the result, let us look at the logic. For the first time, dollar value is minus one. So we have minus one is less than zero, which is actually true. This line of code will be executed. And here we have our new value for dollar value will be minus one minus one which is minus two minus two is less than zero this is true this will be executed again and let's see the result so we have this is minus one minus two minus three all these numbers are less than zero so you can see it continues it continues it continues because the condition is always less than zero so the value continues and this is what we call infinite loop so it continues until you exhaust all your memory so it continues it continues this is infinite loop it is interesting to have infinite loop but don't do it on the live server, I mean on the production environment. So let us change our condition to the correct condition based on the requirements. Nobody will ask you to write uh, an infinite loop. So you only write it due to some mistakes. So let's have, let's clean everything. Okay. So now I think you have a very good understanding of why loop. In this tutorial, we'll be writing another while loop coding. We still have the same question, we have to print hello world why a condition is met. So let's check our IDE. So by this time around, we will not be using a known value. Instead of a known value, we'll be using a random value. Random value in PHP, to get a random value, you have something like this, rand, and you put your ranges. For example, if you want to get a random value from 10 to 13, you have something like this. So our dollar value is going to get a random value. So the loop is going to be executed if our random value, let's assume a condition, if our random value is not equal to 12, the random value can be 10, 11, 12, 13. So when the value is not equal to 12, then let us run hello world. And here also, instead of having dollar value equals to this, let us use this same value here. I mean the random value. 
so you have something like this you have something like this so let us remove this so our dollar value is random value from 10 to 13 the loop is going to continue if the random value is not 12 otherwise we'll be printing hello world on the screen so let us check our browser now So we have hello world 1310 so but to make it to be clearer let us print the random value at every point so we can have something like this echo the random value here is dollar value so we have echo dollar value let us break it so we need to add the html break tag so we have to do the same thing here to make it to be very clear so at every point in time we know our random value so let's check the browser now so you see that the first time at the random value is 11 so the code is going to be executed we have hello word 11 at the second time the random value is also 11 and that is why you are having this so since 11 is not the same thing as 12 in the condition here it means this loop is going to run again so you have hello word 11 the next random number is 10 this 10 is not the same thing as 12 so the block of code is going to be executed again so you have hello word 10 the next random number is 13 so we have hello world 13 the next random number is 12 and when it is 12 our dollar value here is 12 and when it comes here we have 12 is not equal to 12 this is false so the block of code here will not be executed so we move out of the while loop and that terminates our code In this tutorial, I'll be talking about do while loop. In the last tutorial, we talked about while loop, and I mentioned that while loop can be represented by while, this is a condition, and this is a block of code to be executed. But for do while loop, just assume you have the block of code first. This is the block of code. And the while statement here. This is the condition. And lastly, you had do there. The difference between the execution of two statements is that for do while loop, the execution starts from do. After completing this execution, the condition here is checked. If the condition is true, the line of execution goes back here and this block of code is run again. And it continues like that, like the normal while loop. But the point of difference between the two is in the first iteration, I mean in the first loop. If the condition in the first loop is false, in do while loop, this code is going to be executed. But in while loop, this code will not be executed. So this is the only difference between do while loop and while loop. In this tutorial, let us code do while loop. So this is the last example for our while loop. Let us use the example before this. So I'm holding my command Z to back to the previous example. So we have this example. And instead of while loop, we'll be using do while loop. So 
Let us remove the block of code. This should be do. And this is the Y. So we have something like this. So in the example, we started with two. Let us start with two here also. So let's check the results in the browser. So you can remember then we had two hello words also so this is the same thing and we also use four so this is also the same thing we also used eight so this is the same thing and we also used minus one in the case of y loop we did not get any value but for do y, we'll be getting a value now. Let's check. So we have the first value. Why? Because this is going to be executed before checking the condition. And that is the only difference between y loop and the do y loop. In this tutorial, I'll be explaining for loop. In software development, it is very common that you like to execute a block of code in a specified number of times. For example, if you like to execute a block of code five times. In cases like this, you have to use for loop. And for loop is written as for you have three components here and this is the block of code to be executed in all there are four components this is the first component this is the second component this is the third component and this is fourth component which is a block of code to have a loop it starts from the three components, executes the block of code, it goes back to the three component, executes the block of code, and it continues like this. Now I'll explain the components one after the other. This first component is the starting point of the loop. And it is usually an assignment statement. For example, if you want your starting points to be zero, so you can write dollar value or dollar i, which is frequently used in loop, equals to zero. If you want your starting point to be one, you simply have dollar i equals to one. The second component, it determines if the loop should continue or not. And this is actually a conditional statement. The starting point is an assignment statement for the second component, it has to be a conditional statement. That is, it is either true or false. For example, to have a loop of two, if you require two loops, you want your block of code to be executed two times, this component has to be true, true, and force in the last time at this point the loop will break and these two truths signifies that we have two loops the third component is the increment this is the increment to the starting point for example if you want an increment of one 
your starting point, which is dollar i, will be the same thing as dollar i plus one. This is the increment of one. For the increment of two, it will be dollar i equals dollar i plus two. So the third component is basically for increment. And the last component, block of code, which you are very, very used to. So this is the code to be executed in the specified number of times. Let us try some examples of for loop. Let's assume we want two loops. We want a block of code to be executed two times. So let's write our starting point. Let's assume we are starting with zero. So we have dollar i equals to zero. And this condition is usually very complex, so it should be written last. And also it depends on the increment, so you can't write the value now. You have to write the increment before stating this value. The increment and the starting point must be known before you can determine this value. So you have the increment, as long as you want an increment of 1, so it will be dollar $i equals to dollar $i plus 1. So to write this condition, let's have a graphical look of our loop. So let us assume this is the starting point and this is the ending point of each loop. So we have the value of dollar $i here and dollar $i here. So the value of dollar $i when the loop is starting and the value of dollar i when you are ending each loop dollar i for the starting point is zero and between this and this is our increment in our case our increment is one so you put one here so when you begin the first loop you know you are required to write two loops for the first loop you have this coming to this this is a complete loop at this point, our dollar i is 1. And this 1 is going to be the beginning of dollar i for the next loop. So remember, we need two loops. So we can also have another loop. It goes down again. And at this point, our dollar i is 2. For the next one, dollar i is starting with 2. But we don't need any loop again. So it means at the end of the loops, our dollar i is now 2. We need to write a condition that will be false relative to the present condition of our dollar i. Dollar i presently is 2. So if you write a condition like dollar i is not equal to 2, this is going to be false. Because 2 is not equal to 2 is false. You can also write a condition like dollar i is less than 2 dollar i is not less than 2 because dollar i is 2 at this position so this is also false i want to, you have to notice is that these two conditions have to be true in the first two loops let's check when dollar i is equal to 0 for dollar i is 0 we have dollar i is not equal to 2 this will be true for dollar i equals to 1, 1 is not the same thing as 2. This is going to be true. So you see that for the two loops, your condition will be true, true, and false. So let us try for dollar i is less than 2. For the first loop, dollar i is 0. So you have when dollar i equals 0, 0 is less than 2. This is true. When dollar i is 1, one is less than 2. This is also true. So you also know that you'll be having true, true, and false. So we have true, true, which signifies we have two loops, and this is not a loop. It shows that this true, true, conforms with the requirements of the question.
So we can write our loop as this. For our starting point is zero. The second component is now dollar i is not equals to two. And the last component is dollar i equals to dollar i plus one. And this is the block of code. It can also be written as four dollar i is zero dollar i is less than two dollar i equals dollar i plus one and this is the block of code so let's take another example we are also writing two loops in this example but let's change some of the components for the starting points let us assume our starting point is 1. This is difficult to determine. And our increment, let us assume an increment of 1 also. So $i equals $i plus 1. So to determine the second component, so this is our $i, this is the starting point, and this is the ending point. So at the starting point, $i is 1. And the increment is plus 1. So we have 1 here. So the first loop, this we move to this. And at the end of the loop, our $i is now 2. This is going to be the starting point of the next loop. When you move down, this is 3. And this is going to be the starting point of the next loop. But we only need two loops. So it means by the end of the two loops, $i equals to 3. So to write our condition, we can either have $i is not equals to 3, or we have $i is less than 3. So to write our answer, it's going to be 4 $i equals to 1 dollar i is not equals to 3 dollar i equals to dollar i plus 1 and this is the block of code and the second way is writing something like 4 dollar i is 1 dollar i is less than 3 dollar i equals dollar i plus one and this is a block of code so let us take another example assuming we want three loops so let's assume a starting point dollar i to be zero this is difficult to determine and our increment let's assume an increment of two so we have dollar i equals dollar i plus two so let us draw our graphical representation so this is start so you have dollar i dollar i this is the starting point and this is the ending point our starting point this is zero so, and the increment this time around is 2, so this is 2. So 0, so this will come 2, and this 2 will be the starting point here. This is the first loop. The second loop, this will be 4. The third loop, this will be 6. And to start another loop, no. Because we've completed three loops, which is one, two, three. So at this point, our dollar i is six. To write the second component, it's going to be dollar i is not equal to six, or we can write it as dollar i is less than six. So to write the for loop, we have four dollar i equals zero, the starting point, 
dollar i is not equals to six and dollar i equals to dollar i plus two. So and this is a block of code. So for the second type, it's going to be four dollar i equals to zero. Dollar i is less than six. Dollar i equals to dollar i plus two. We have the block of code in. In this tutorial, I will tell you the easy method to write for loop. In the last tutorial, we wrote our components in different ways. In this tutorial, I will tell you easy method to write each component. For the first component, which is the starting point, start from zero, that is, you have your dollar i to be zero. The second component, which is a condition, use less than sign. And thirdly, which is the increment, use an increment of one. That is, you have a dollar i equals dollar i plus one. For example, to write two loops. We know our starting point is i equals to zero. We've now determined this. And the increment, which is the third condition, will be dollar i equals to dollar i plus one. So now to write the second component. Let us assume we have our graphical representation. The increment is one. And this is the starting point, this is dollar i, dollar i as the ending point of each loop. We are starting from zero. For the first loop, we have something like this. Our dollar i in this place will be one. And this one is the starting point here. And here it is two. So the starting point here is two, but we only need two loops. This is the first loop and this is the second loop to meet the requirements of the question. So it means we are stopping at two. To use the less than sign, our condition should be dollar i is less than two. So let us write the for loop now. So it should be for dollar i equals zero, dollar i is less than two, and we have dollar i equals to dollar i plus one and this will be the block of code so this is for two loops but one interesting thing is that at every point in time the requirement i mean the number of loops required Will be the same thing as the value you have here so it makes things to be very very easy so to write four loops you can easily write it as four dollar i equals zero which is our starting point the condition will be dollar i is less than four this and this number will be the same thing and we have dollar i equals to dollar i plus one so this is a block of code. So this is a very easy method. At every point in time, this and this will be the same thing. Start from zero, use a less than sign, and use an increment of one. Another thing to add is that the increment of one is so very common to the extent that it has a short hand. What I mean is that the increment of 1, which is dollar $i plus 1, is very common. And because of this, it has a shorthand. 
the shorthand is simply writes dollar i plus plus so it means our two loops can be written as four dollar i equals zero dollar i is less than two remember this and this should be the same thing so instead of writing this we only have dollar i plus plus which is the shorthand and here you have a block of code So to write, let's write something like 10 loops with our easy method to be 4, the starting point is 0, the condition is less than, and this should be the number of loops, remember this and this should be the same thing, and the increment is dollar $i plus plus, and here we have the block of code. To write 100 loops, so it's very simple also to be four dollar i you are starting from zero dollar i must be less than the number of loops dollar i plus plus and here we have the block of code with this simple method you can easily write any loop of your choice in the next tutorial we'll be writing loops in our ide and check the result on the browser. In this tutorial, I'll be coding for loop. The question is to repeat hello world in two times, five times, and 10 times. So because the number of times is specified, we'll be using for loop. And also we'll be using our recommended way, that is the easy method. Remember, the components should be, the first one is that we start from zero. The second one is to use less than sign for the second component, that is for the condition. And the third component, use an increment of one. So we have dollar $i plus plus. So let's do the coding. For two times, we can uh, remove this to start. So you have for loop for dollar i equals to zero, the starting point. And the condition, since it is two times, we have dollar i is less than two. And the increment is dollar i plus plus and here we have echo hello world so we can add a break to it So it is done. Let's check our result on the browser. So let's refresh. So you can see we have hello world two times. For the second question, we have hello world five times. All we have to do is to change the second component. So let's do it. So instead of two, we have five. So let us save it and check the browser we refresh you can see we have one two three four five hello world five times and the last question we have 14 times all we have to do is to change the same value here also make it 10 save your file and check the browser just refresh the browser and we have hello world 10 times so with this, it is very easy to write for loop. In this tutorial, I'll be explaining the difference between while and for loop. The similitude of while and for loop is the similitude of academic calendars of two universities. 
one university runs a for loop academic calendar while the other runs a while loop academic calendar for the for loop academic calendar a four year course is always four years except they are very serious issue when a student gains admission in the follow-up academic calendar university it is certain that after four years he becomes a graduate but for the wild loop academic calendar a four-year course is always four plus x number of years where x is an unknown which can be as a result of strikes a looter and some other reasons in the wild loop academic calendar when a student gains admission into the university he knows that the only thing that is certain is when he completes all his courses is going to become a graduate but this can be done in four years five years six years or and above he is not certain of the number of years for him to become a graduate but he knows that if he's able to pass all the required courses, then he becomes a graduate. These two situations can be represented in coding. For the for loop academic calendar, at the starting point, the student holds, let us assume this is holding the student, he has an SSC certificate. At this point, the student is SSC order. For a four-year course, it means he's going to spend four years in the university. So we'll be writing a for loop. So we have four dollar i is zero. Dollar i is less than four. Dollar i plus plus. In the loop, the student is an undergraduate of this university so you can write student is undergraduate it will remain to be an undergraduate for four good years and that is when the loop is running and after four years you will see the student here at this point is a graduate so this is the representation of the for loop academic calendar let us write for the while loop academic calendar for the while loop academic calendar at the starting point also the student holds an SSA certificate so you have SSCE Order. Now the requirement that is certain is that when he completes all the required courses, then he becomes a graduate. Otherwise, he remains to be an undergraduate. So we can write a while loop like while requirements. not completed every time the requirement is not completed then the student is still an undergraduate so this while loop can run in maybe like four years five years six years or seven years so but when the requirements are being met this condition will be false in that case the student becomes a graduate so the two codes can be compared like this academic calendar of two universities this is for the for loop academic calendar and this is the while loop academic calendar
In this tutorial, I'll be talking about break statement in PHP. As a software developer, you have full control of your program. And this is applicable in for loop also. In for loop, a loop that is meant to run four times can change based on some requirements. For example, at first you had a requirement that allows the loop to run four times. But based on some other requirements, you may decide to leave the loop after making two iterations. I mean after having two loops. In that case, you use a break statement. We have a loop that is meant to run four times, that is $i equals to zero. $i is less than four and $i plus plus. This is a block of code. If you are now required to break this loop after making two loops, you remember that graphically this is the starting point which is zero this is one and this is the increment dollar i here is zero it makes a loop here dollar i is now one at this state it is one after completing here it is two if you only require to make the loop to run twice instead of four times it means when dollar i is two you can break the loop so this is how to write the statement. You write a conditional statement inside the for loop. You have something like if $i equals to 2, then break. At this point, when $i equals to 2, the loop will not continue again. And the line of execution will go to this point. So instead of seeing four loops, we'll be seeing two loops because of this condition. If $i equals to 2, then break the loop. So let's put this down in coding. In our last example, we wrote four loops. For example, if you want 5 loops, you can make this to be 5. So let's check the result in the browser. So this is 5 loops. And if you like, you can attach the value of $i. So you can put $i here, so that we know the value of $i at every loop. So let's refresh, we have... At this point, $i is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now, let us break the loop when $i is 2. So we have if $i equals to 2. You know, this is a conditional statement, and that is why it is having 2 equals to sign. At this point, break the loop. So let's check our result. So you can see as dollar i equals to two, there won't be any loop. So the line of execution when dollar i equals to two jumps here. And to confirm that, let us add a statement here. Echo. This is the end of the loop. So we have a statement like this. So let us check it on the browser. So you can see after the two loops, the line of execution jumps here, which marks the end of the loop. A break statement will break out of the entire loop and the line of execution will jump to the next point.
In this tutorial, I'll be talking about continue in loops. Continue statement is very similar to break statement. The only difference between the two is that while break statement terminates the entire loop, continue only terminates the current loop. It moves the line of execution to the next loop. So continue does not terminate the entire loops, rather it terminates the current loop and moves the line of execution to the next loop. For example, if you have a for loop, which is meant to run four times. Assuming this is a block of code. At the point if $i equals to 2 and you want to continue here, the difference is that let us do it graphically. This is your starting point, which is 0, and this is increment. In the first iteration, you have this $i is 1, and this condition is false. The second iteration, this is 2. For the third iteration, $i is starting from 2. And at this point, when $i equals to 2, this statement will be executed, continue. The meaning is that this loop should be skipped, but you move to the next loop, which is 3. When $i equals to 3, you have another loop. So instead of having four loops, you'll be having three loops because one of the loops will be skipped when $i equals to 2. This is the difference between continue and break. Break terminates the entire loop while continue only terminates the current loop and moves the line of execution to the next loop. Let us see the differences in actual coding and check the result in the browser. For this statement, if you use continue instead of break, let us check our results. So we have command S. So let's check the result here. So we have hello world when $i is 0, hello world when $i is 1. But when $i equals to 2, hello world statement is missing because of the continuous statement here. Anything below here will not be executed when this condition is true. And the condition was actually true when $i equals to 2. But instead of going out of the loop entirely, for continuous statement, it will only go to the next iteration. That is when $i equals to 3. And this will be skipped because this condition will be false. And this will be printed on the screen. And that is why we are having hello world $3, hello world $4. And finally, we have echo. This is the end of the loop. Because originally, the loop is meant to run 5 times. So this is the difference between continue and break. In this tutorial, I'll be talking about arrays. In one of our previous tutorials, I mentioned that data can be stored in variable. For example, you can have a variable city storing data, something like Ikeja. But if you store another data in the same variable, say for example, storing kernel, this first data will be lost. Also, if you store the same in the same variable, if you store another data, maybe something like a word, this second data also will be lost. 
and the way to solve this problem is using different variables for each city for example we can write it as dollar city one equals to ikeja dollar city two equals to kanu and dollar city three equals to oweri but imagine we have a very long list in this case we need a better method to tidy up our data and in cases like this we use what is called an array which is a special data type for storing list of data it stores list of data an array is a special variable which can hold more than one value at a time basically an array can hold list of data and a practical example of an array is mathematical sets you will see that a mathematical set can hold a list of instruments in php an array is written as assuming you have a list of cities it can be represented as cities equals array and the list of the cities we put here for example we can represent our previous example as dollar cities equals array of the first one is Ikeja the second one is Kano and the third one is Owele so this single variable is now holding list of data in PHP there are three different types of array the first one is index array the second one is associative array and the third one is multi-dimensional array in subsequent tutorials i'll be discussing each array one after the other in this tutorial i'll be talking about index arrays in the last tutorial i mentioned that array can hold list of data and none of the data will be overwritten by the previous one to maintain this standard all arrays operate in key value pair that is each element in the array has a unique key no two values i mean no two data must have the same key if you want to get a data, you must have the key to the data, otherwise you can't get the data. In index array, there are predefined keys. We have predefined keys. And the keys start from 0, 1, 2, and it continues. It depends on the length of the array. For example, in our case, we have dollar cities to be an array of Ikeja. We have Kanu and Oweri. In this case, Ikeja, we have a key of zero Kano we have a key of one and this key will be two if the element in the array is four the next element will have a key of three so in index array there are predefined keys you don't need to define the keys 
and to access the data for example we said our cities this array of Ikeja Kano and Oweri to access each of the data all we have to do is to write dollar cities we put a bracket and we put the key value here so for the first one it's going to be dollar cities this is zero this is going to have access to the first data which is Ikeja for the second one it will be dollar cities the key to this is one and this will have access to Kano and the third one which is over if you have dollar cities it's bracket two this will have access to over so this is how to access data in index array the summary of index array is that it has predefined keys which starts from zero one two three and it continues depending on the size of the array in the next class we'll be playing with index array in our ide and we'll be checking the results on the browser in this tutorial i'll be writing some codes on index arrays so this is my ide So you can remove this. So let's assume we have our array of cities, which is holding this is array of you can use double quote or single quote. We have Ikeja. Second, we have Kano, and we also have Oweri. So to access our data, we can write something like this, echo ct1 is, so we have dollar cities, and for the first one it is zero, we can have echo City two is we have dollar city and that is the array and the index which is the key is one and we also have echo city three is And the index of this, which is the key, is 2. Now let us save and check our results on the browser. Let us refresh this page. So we have city 1, city 2, or city 3. Let us add a break statement. So let us break it here. Add this to break it so that we can see it clearly. So we can copy this and paste the remaining two lines. So we have this. If something is wrong here, we need to put this, and here also we have to put this. We notice that the ID changed color because now everything is perfect so let us refresh the page so we now have it in this format which is very readable since one is Ikeja, city two is Kao, city three is Oe so this is how to access data in index array in this tutorial let us write some codes on index arrays.
In the last tutorial, we were able to print each item in the array with this code. If we study the code very well, we notice some things. The first one is that we notice that this piece of code is a form of repetition. So it means this is a loop. And also, we notice that we have three repetitions and we have three elements in the array. At every point in time, the number of elements in the array will be the number of repetitions we'll be having. And this perfectly follows for loop. So we know this is a for loop. The third thing to note is that if you look at the value here, you see that this is the same thing as our starting point, which is zero. You can remember that normally we have something like this. Our starting point is usually zero. This is the first loop. This is one. This is the second loop. And this is the third loop. You can see that the values of dollar i are zero, one, two, which is exactly what we have here. So this is zero, one, two. So we can draw some conclusions that uh, dollar i equals to zero. This is the starting point. Our condition is dollar i is less than three because we have three loops, which is also the number of elements in the array one, two, three, and also our increment is one. So with this information, we can write a for loop. The for loop will be something like four dollar i which is our starting point equals to zero dollar i is less than three which is the number of items in the array and we have dollar i plus plus now to write the block of code you only need to execute a piece of line and repeat three times so to write it we have echo this is city one we don't know how to get the value of 1 now, so we can repeat it as ct1 is dollar cities. So instead of writing 0 now, we can write dollar i. Because in the first loop, dollar i will be 0. In the second loop, dollar i will be 1. And in the third loop, dollar i will be two. So this matches what we have here. The only thing we have to change is this value of one. Because for the three iterations, we'll be having city one is this, city one is this, city one is this. So let us put down this into coding. And later we can adjust the value of city high. So this is our ID. So instead of this, we can remove this code or just comment it. Control backspace. So we have four dollar i is zero. Dollar i is less than three. And we have dollar i plus plus. So we have echo we have for now we are still having city one is so we have dollar cities so we have opening and closing bracket and instead of writing zero now we have value of dollar i So we can add this break statement. We can easily copy from here. So we have something like this. So let us check the result on the browser. So we refresh. So we have 
City 1 is Ikeja, City 2, City 1 is Kano, City 1 is Uri. So let us find a way to manipulate this value to be 1, 2, 3. So to write city one, it's going to be written as city. You notice that at every point in time, our dollar I is increasing. It starts from zero. So it means this one should be one plus dollar I. So you can have something like this. Dollar I plus one. At first time, this dollar I will be zero. In the second time, it will be 1 plus 1, which is 2. And at the third time, it will be 2 plus 1, which is 3. So let us write this in our IDE. So this is our code. So to write this one, we have to do the calculation first before appending to city. So to do that, we have to do some concatenation. So we have to do some concatenation. We will learn more on concatenation in string. So we have to add the values before appending to city. So we have dollar i plus one. So in the first case we have zero plus one, which is one. Second iteration will be one plus one, which is two, and third one will be two plus one, which is three. So with this, we will have our code. So let us refresh. So we have city one, city two, city three. So with this code, we're able to generate all these lines of code. And actually, if you add more to it, for example, if you like to add more cities like Wari, like let's add Kaduna. Let's add something like uh, Badminton. You know, probably another place like Shokoto. So to continue, so let's add like Local Jam, like Line. So it continues. So let's paint this out. Notice that this value is no more 3 because the elements in the array has changed. So instead of 3, it should be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So this should be 9. Let's check the value. So you can see we have all the 9 cities in the array. And one more thing I would like to add is that to avoid changing this value every time, there is a way to know the size of any array. It is very simple. To know the size of any array, we use a function called count. To find the size of the array, as in this is dollar size, we should hold the size of the array. It is written as count. We have to count this array. Count dollar cities. So this we count the number of items in dollar cities and assign the value to this variable. So in order to avoid changing this value, we can now add size here, which is the size of our array. So let's check the answer in the browser. You see that we have the same results. So to prove this to be right, let us add more cities. So let us add Calabar. So we can add more cities. Let us add. Let us add Jalingo. So this time around, we are not changing the value of the size because we know that this function will automatically get the size of the array so let's save and check our results in the browser so you can see that automatically the size of the array changes because of the function
So it means anytime you want to look through an array, you can easily use the functions from here to here. In this tutorial, we'll be solving another problem. We have to find the maximum number in this array. To solve problems like this, we have to break it down into a simple task. And that is, we have two basic logics in this problem. The first one is, we must know how to find the maximum of two numbers. And the second one, we must know how to loop through an array. For the first one, assuming we have two numbers A and B, the maximum of A and B should be if A is greater than B, then A is the maximum. Otherwise, B is the maximum. And the second part is looping through an array, which we did in one of our previous tutorial. So we'll be using for loop. So how do we now combine these two logics to solve this problem? So this is our array. To solve the problem, we need to keep track of our maximum value so we can keep the value in a variable called maximum. And first of all, assign the first value in the array to be the maximum value. So you assign this to be 5. And anytime we come across a number which is greater than our maximum, then we can change the maximum value. This is just the logic. Otherwise, you will not change the maximum value. So you can keep track of maximum value. This is our maximum value. And let us compare here. And if it changes, we have a new maximum value. So for the first one, our maximum value is 5. So is 5 greater than 5? No. So we still have the same maximum value. The second value is minus 2. Our maximum value is still 5 here. So we have is minus 2 greater than 5? No. So our maximum value is still 5. We change the maximum value anytime we come across a number that is greater than the maximum value. So our maximum value is still 5 here. The next value here is 7. Is 7 greater than 5? This is true. So our maximum value will change to 7. So here the maximum value is now 7. The next number is 8. Is 8 greater than 7? Yes. So the next maximum value, the new maximum value is now 8. So which is what we have here. Is 4 greater than 8? No. So we still retain the same maximum value, which is 8. So finally, our maximum value for the array is 8. So let us put this down in coding. So our array is 5 minus 2, 7, 8, 4. So you can remove this. So let's say as you have array of numbers. This array, you have 5, you have minus 2, you have 7, you have 8, and we have 4. So this is our array. At first, we had the first number to be the maximum value. So it's simply numbers the first value has the index of zero so you put zero here so we assume this is our first maximum number so now we can look through the array 
But before doing that, let us get the size of our array. The size of the array is count. And we have our array which is numbers. So in the looping now we have four dollar i is zero dollar i is less than the size of the array and the increment is dollar i plus plus here we'll be comparing our present maximum number with the numbers in the array first of all let us get the number in the array at every point in time our number should be the array which is numbers and we had index which is dollar i so this is the number at any point in time we can confirm that by we can confirm that by printing it out let us print it we can verify this by printing the number next and next we can verify this we can verify this by printing it out and check it. We can verify this by printing it. We can verify this by printing it out. So let's have something like this echo dollar number. So, and uh, to make it clearer, let us put a break statement. So you have something like this. So let's check the result on the browser. So we can refresh this page. So these are the numbers in the array. Now let us do the comparison. Can I remove this code? So at any point in time, when we meet a number that is greater than our current maximum number, we have to change the maximum number. That is, if our present number, our present number, if it is greater than our maximum value, in that case, we have to update our maximum value. So our maximum value will be that number. Remember that when we are assigning to values, we assign the value A to the value A. And that is why if you have a variable, for example, dollar value equals to 2. The meaning is that we are putting this value 2 to x. It is similar to our mathematics where you have x equals to 2. You are assigning the value of 2 into x. So you have to note that. So in this case also, you are putting the value number into maximum. So if the number is greater than maximum, we update our maximum to be a new number. And after completing the entire loop, we can print out our maximum value. So you have echo dollar maximum. So this is going to be the last maximum number. So let's save and check the answer in the browser. So we are getting an error on line 12. So let's check line 12, there's an error there. So line 12, and we can check the line before it. So you are missing the semicolon here. So let us add it and check again. So you can see the maximum value is 8. The maximum value is 8. And if you check the array, the maximum value is 8. If you continue to add more numbers, assuming we had another 7 or we should add a number like uh, 2, or we had 12. So let's save and update.
let's refresh you can see the maximum is 12 so the logic is very simple at first assume that your maximum value is the first value and in the loop check if the current number is greater than the maximum if it is greater than the maximum you have to update the maximum value otherwise don't do anything and when you finish the entire loop it means you've reached all the numbers after that you can print out your maximum number In this tutorial, I'll be talking about associative arrays. In the last tutorial, I talked about index array. And one unique thing about index array is that it has predefined index, which starts from 0, 1, 2, 3, and it continues depending on the length of the array. These index are also known as keys. But in associative arrays, we have to define our keys and form a relationship between the key and the value. The relationship is normally written as dollar key is pointing to dollar value. This is the key and this is the value. For example, if you like to create a key 0 which is pointing to a value 10 so it will be written like this and also you can have another data type you can have something like add which is a string pointing to another value maybe something like 20 so the keys can be of any data type for example in the case of the first one this is an integer and for the case of this, this is a string. So you can have any data type as a key and any data type as a value. For example, if you like to form an array of ages of students in a class, wherein the key, we have key value, the key should be the name of the student, while the value should be the age of the student to form this array it will written as dollar ages equals array we have the key value the key is the name of the student you can have something like adewale and it is pointed to a value assuming adewale is 15 years old comma you can also have a student which is Amaka. So maybe the value is 13, she is 13 years old. Or we can have Aisha, which is assuming she is 14 years old. So with this, we've represented the ages of students in a class in an associative array. This array can also be represented in another format. Let us assume this is the first format. The second format is creating a variable array with the key. We have this is Adewale. So you can assign the value to it like this. And also you have ages. The key is Amaka. you can assign value to it and lastly we have ages we have Aisha and the value is 14 one important thing you have to note here is that this keys has to be unique that is no two values must have the same key now let us represent our associative array in our ide and do some programming in this tutorial i'll be writing some codes on associative arrays so let's go to our ide In the last tutorial, 
we we'll mentioned that a associative array occurs in key value pair. So let's form an associative array of dollar ages equals array. We have the key to be the name of the student. So let's assume we have Adewale and this is pointing to assuming it's 15 years and you also have Amaka assuming Amaka is 13 years and we have Aisha So assuming she is 14 years. So with these, we have formed an associative array. So you can check this by printing the values. As we would like to echo dollar ages and we have the key, which is Adewale. Instead of using indexes as key as we did in index array, in this case, this is our key. So let's check the result in the browser. So we have to refresh this. So you can see 15 years. Adewale is 15 years old. So you can print the remaining ages of students. So we have echo ages for Amaka. So we can add a break statement here as we did in so many previous examples. So we have this. And we can copy it here also. And lastly, let us print the age of Aisha. Okay, so let's check the results in the browser. So you can see that we are able to get all the values in the associative array using the respective key. In this tutorial, I'll be writing more codes on associative array. In the previous code, we were able to print all the values of this associative array. But if we had another person to this array, assuming we have Ibrahim, which is 11 years old, So to get the value, to get the value, we have to provide Ibrahim as a key here, and it continues like that. But this is not a very good solution. We need a solution such that any value given in the array, we can easily loop through all the keys and values in the array, as we did in the indexed array. In the indexed array, through the help or the for loop, we're able to print all the elements in the array. Let us check if the for loop can also work for associative array. Remember, the for loop is written as for dollar i is zero, dollar i is less than we said the size of the array. And dollar i plus plus. So with this, we're able to look through an index array. But one thing we notice is that for an index array, we remember 
that the index is starts from 0 through 1 through 2 3 and it continues depending on the length of the array and we also establish that these indexes are also equivalent to dollar i but for an associative array our key can be of any value it can also be of any data type So there is no guarantee that our first index has to be 0 and our second index has to be 1. If we try to access the array in the for loop, we have our dollar ages. In this case, if you have dollar ages and we have the index here, we notice that this will always be 0, 1, 2, 3. But in our case, we want something like dollar ages adewale and so on as we did in the previous example. So it means this type of loop is not applicable for associative array. Because of this, we have a special loop for associative array. And this loop is known as for each. It is very easy to apply for each for an associative array. All you have to do is to see each of the elements in the array as a row of data. For example, in our case of dollar ages, we have Adewale. Pointing to 15, we have Amaka pointing to 13, and we also have Aisha pointing to 14. So see these data as if they are arranged vertically on each other. With the four each, you are able to get the first data. In the first loop, you can get both key and value. In the second loop, you can get this second data. And in the third loop, you can get this. And this is the syntax for the for each. You write it as for each, the name of the array. In our case, it is dollar ages. For each of the elements in ages, make it to be as dollar key pointing to dollar value and here you can access each of the key and value pair so in the first loop it's going to access the first value so you can easily have something like echo dollar key and you separate it maybe with a space and you can print your dollar value here so you can have an empty space here and you have dollar value here with this we can get each item on each row so let us check this in our IDE in the next story In this tutorial, I will apply for each to look through all the elements in our previous array. So let's go to the IDE. So instead of this, we can remove everything here. So we can have our for each loop. So we have our array which is dollar ages as our key pointing to value.
And in the body, you can have something like echo dollar key. Let's have a break. Does that mean you have a space here and dollar value? So with this, you can get all the elements in the array in the key value format. And lastly, let us add a break statement so that you can easily differentiate each element. We have br. So it is done now. Let's check our browser. We need to refresh. So you can see this is the key and this is the value. So if you had another element to it, if you have a maker, assuming is 12 years old, so we have this. In this tutorial, I'll be solving another problem on associative array. And the question is, given an array ages which represent the names and ages of students in the class, we have to find the name of the earlier student in the class. This question is similar to one of the previous questions we solved and that is finding the largest number in an array. If you remember, in solving the question, we took two steps. The first one is setting a default value. And the second one was looping through the array. And anytime you find a number which is greater than the default number, that number automatically becomes the maximum number. We continue with this to the end of the array. The solution to this is also similar to these two steps, but with some little modifications. The first one setting the default. In this case, we'll be setting default for two variables. In this case, we'll be setting default for the age and also the name of student. Now, I will teach you how to find default when solving any problem. In this case, we are dealing with the first one is age. We have to find the maximum. So all you have to do is to draw a straight line like this. As I mean, this is zero, this is one, two, three, four, and it continues like this. And this is minus one, minus two, the negative side. You have to find the maximum value. The maximum value always points towards this direction. To find the default, the default has to be directly opposite the maximum value. So the default will be pointing towards this direction. To choose a default, choose a number that is extremely not possible. For example, we are dealing with age. Choose something that is not possible in this direction. An age of a person can never be minus one or something like minus one million. Something that is extremely not possible. And in PHP, we have a constant to represent number that is extremely negative. And that is the most negative integer you can have in PHP. So it is written as PHP int minimum. This is the lowest integer you can have in PHP and the value is something like minus two point, minus two billion. 
So this is the value. So we can simply represent our default age in a question wherein we are finding maximum by number that is extremely low. Let us try for minimum value. Assume we like to find in a question, we want to find a minimum value. So let's find a default. In this case, you can draw the same line. This is zero, this is one, two, three, four. This is minus one, minus two, minus three. In this case, you are finding minimum value which points towards this direction. Your default value should be extremely opposite. So this is the default value. So it means your default value can be something extremely large, maybe something like 1 million. So just choose a number that is extremely large and something that is not possible. In this case, assume you want to find the minimum age. Something extremely large that is not possible is something like 1 million. Or otherwise, you can also use the largest integer in PHP, which is PHP int maximum and the value of this is plus this time around 2 billion so with this you can find minimum or maximum in any question we are solving the next thing is to set default for name to set default for name you also choose something that is extremely not possible. For example, if you are setting the default to be an empty string, you are pretty sure that nobody will have a name that is empty. Or maybe something like asterisk, because I don't think you can't have any name with asterisk like this. So this is how to set default value in any problem you are solving in software development make the default be something that is extremely impossible so the second step is loop but in this case since we are dealing with associative array we'll be using for each loop anytime we have an age which is greater than the maximum then that age becomes the maximum and the name attached to the age will be the name of the person that has the highest age. In the next tutorial, we will be putting everything into code. So, we are now in our IDE that to find the name of the person with the highest age. So, all we have to do first is to set the default values. Remember, we are finding the maximum. So the first thing is to set the default value. So you have maximum age. Remember, the default value should go in the opposite direction. So this is maximum. So you have to choose the lowest possible value in PHP. And that is PHP underscore int underscore minimum. So this will be our default value for age. And also for name, we have name, let's use an empty string, so we can remove this. So when we look through the array, anytime we have a number, if our age, which is dollar value, remember this is key value, and this is a key, this is the value, the value is now the age. So anytime you find a value which is age, greater than the maximum age in that case that age becomes the maximum so our maximum age is now the value and also the name of the person is now you know this is the name this is the value so this is name oh this has to be key so this key this is the name this is the age so anytime the value is greater than the so anytime 
the age is greater than the default value, this age, which is value, becomes the maximum age, and the name attached to this value becomes the name of the person. So with this, when the loop run through all the elements, at this place, you can get the name of the person. So you have echo dollar name. So this will be the name of the person with highest age. So let's check it. So something is wrong on line 12. Let's check. So we have to put a semicolon here. Okay. So let's check again. So you can see this is the name of the person, Adewale. Let's check who has the highest age. It's 15, 13, 12, 14. So this is the highest age and the name of the person is Adewale. So let's add another student to the class. So as we we have Bisala. So as we she is 18 years old. So let's refresh. We have the maximum age. The eldest person is now Bisola. You can see she is 18 years old. Or you can make this to be more user friendly. So let's write something like this. The name of the eldest person in the class is this. So you have to put a dot to concatenate. Who is let's concatenate? Let's write the age of the person. That is maximum age. Who is this? You have to put a dot also. Years old. Okay, something like this. So this will be more readable. So the name of the eldest person in the class is Bisola, who is 18 years old. Another thing I like to do now is to print this value of PHP minimum so that we can all see it. So but before that, let us add a break statement here. So you have BR this. So you have echo, so let's copy the value, okay, so let's check our browser, so you can see this is 2 billion, 1, 2, 3, so you can see it is minus 2 billion, so and for the maximum, This will be the positive side. So there's a positive side. So anytime you want to find a maximum value, set your default to be minimum. And anytime you want to find a minimum value, set your default to maximum. In this tutorial, I'll be talking about multidimensional arrays. In our previous tutorials, we know an array can be defined as array 2, 4, 6, 8. This is a very simple array. And this can also be written as array 2, 4, 6, 8. This and this are the same thing. We notice that each element in the array is a simple data type. In this case, this is an integer. And this, and we can also have an array like this. 
array A, B, C. In this case, this is a string. But in multidimensional array, instead of expecting a simple data type, it is simply array of arrays. For example, it can be written as array. And instead of expecting an integer or a string or any simple data type, we'll be having an array A. So you can have this array minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. And after this, you have to put a comma. So the same thing applies here. You can also have an array. This can be 0, 1, 2, 3. So basically, multidimensional arrays are arrays of arrays. In subsequent tutorials, I will always like to refer to this outer array as a parent array. And the inner array as child array. Each of the inner array will be referred to as child array. In this tutorial, I'll be talking about the different forms of multidimensional arrays. Based on the types of the parent and child array, multidimensional arrays can be divided into two forms. The first one is same array, that is, both the parent and the child of the same array type. For example, the parent can be index array and also the child is also index array. So this is a possibility. And the other one is a parent can be associative array and also the child can also be associative array. This is also a possibility. So these are the two forms on that same array. The other type is different arrays. So you have In this case, the parent and the child are of different array types. So you can have something like this. The parent can be index array. And the child can be associative array. This is a possibility. Another possibility is you can have the parent to be associative array and the child will be index array. So we have like four different forms. In subsequent tutorials, I'll be talking about these four different forms. In this tutorial, I'll be talking about the first form of multidimensional array. And the first form is when both the parent and the child are both index array. For example, we have array of numbers. So it will be array this is also an array. Assuming we have one, two, 
to the four. You have a comma array two four six eight. And assuming lastly we have array three six nine. It is not compulsory that all the arrays must have the same length. Even you can have an array here that is 10 or something like that. Or even an empty array can be one of the elements of the parent array. So now let us do some observations. The first one is that for the parent array, these are the indexes. This is 0, 1, 2, 3. Just ignore anything that comes behind. The index of the parent array is 0, 1, 2, 3. It means to get the element here, all I have to do is to set the index to be 0. So it will be dollar numbers. I have this. So this will give me all the elements there, which is now an array. If I have index to be 3, I will get the element here, which is also an array. So let's move further. This array also has its own indexes. This is also 0, 1, 2, and 3. For me to get the first value here, I have to apply the index to this array. Everything here is now my array. So to get the first value here, all I have to do is to do something like this and put zero here. So with this, I can get this value of one. So it means to get any value, let's play with another one, to get a value like 4 now, all I have to do, I mean the value here, which has an index of 3. The parent index is 0 and the child index is 3. So it's going to be dollar numbers. The parent index is 0 and the child index is 3. So with this, I can get this value. And let's try to get this value. It will be dollar numbers. The index here for the parent is 0, 1, 2. This is 2. And the index for the child is 0, 1, 2. So this is also 2. Now let us implement what I've explained in code and check the result on our browser. So this is our ID. We can remove everything here to form our multidimensional array. So as we have array of numbers, which is array So this is also an array. We have the inner array here. So assuming this is one, two, three, four. We also have a comma array. We can have two, four, six, eight. Also have an array. This can be three, six, nine. It is not composed, you they have to be of the same length. I can also have an array five. So this is a multi-dimensional array. So let us access the first value here. And the first value for the parent, the index is zero. And for the child, the index is also zero. So let us try to echo. 
dollar numbers for the parent it is zero and for the child it's also zero so let us print this value but i think there is an error here you have to put a semicolon here so let's check our browser see the value is one and if you see here the false value is one so let's try to get this value nine so this value should be zero one two zero one two so this should be two and this also should be two so let's refresh so you can see we have nine with this explanation i'm very sure you can get any element in this form in this tutorial i'll be talking about looping through a multi-dimensional array that falls in form one that is both parent and child are index arrays so first of all i can divide my board into two different apps so as I mean I have a parent array which is same thing as array of this is also an array we have some elements here that is index array maybe one two three four we also have another array Maybe it is two, four, six. And you also have another array, which is three, six, nine. So this is a multi-dimensional array, and both the parent and index are index arrays. So to look through the parent array, since we know it is index array, we can have something like four dollar i equals to zero this is the starting point dollar r is less than the size of the array which is count parent dollar i plus plus and we have the closing so to get each of the elements you know this is assumed to be zero one two so we can get each of the element which is the child we have dollar child equals dollar parent with the index which is dollar i so but this child is also an array it is also an index array so we also need to look through this child array so it means we'll be having another for loop for this child array so you have another for loop which is inside the main for loop we have dollar instead of using dollar i we'll be using another alphabet so you have dollar j equals zero the starting point dollar j is less than the count of the child array and we have dollar j plus plus so here we can get each element of dollar child for example if you like to echo each of the elements you have echo dollar child and the index is dollar j so we have something like this so you see that we have a for loop for the parents array and inside the for loop we also have another for loop for the child array because the child array is also an index array so we have another for loop for the child so this is now written as dollar child dollar j this is the index another way of writing it is that instead of writing dollar child we know dollar child is same thing as dollar parent dollar i instead of we know that dollar child is same thing as dollar child which is dollar parent dollar i so this can be written as echo instead of dollar child you have 
dollar parent dollar i instead of writing dollar child we have dollar parent dollar i so we have dollar parent dollar i so this is representing child and after this we have dollar j so this and this are the same thing now let us code this in our ide so let us look through this array so first of all we can remove this so we have four the parent array starting from dollar i equals to zero dollar i is less than the parent array the count of the parent array which is count of the parent array which is dollar numbers we have dollar i plus plus so here we can get each of the child array so we have dollar child the same thing as dollar numbers which is the print array dollar i well since dollar child is also an index array we also need to look through it to get each of its elements so we have another for loop for this time around we'll be starting from dollar j because we already have dollar i a so we have to use another variable to keep the counter so dollar j is zero dollar j is less than the count of the child so we have dollar child dollar j plus plus and here we can access each of the elements of the child array so we can have echo dollar child and the index is dollar j so we have something like this so with this we can access each of the elements of the child with this loop and this loop can access each of the children that is from year 0 1 2 3 but this inner loop can access this 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 and this so to make it clear let us add a space here so you have an empty space so now let's check the browser let's refresh so you have all the numbers together oh, but let's make it to be more readable after looping through the elements here let us add a break so that we know that this array is different from this array in this loop we'll be looping through all the elements here and after the loop we can add a break statement so let's have echo we had a break statement here, something like this. So let's check our browser. So you can see this is the first array, second array, third, and fourth. The last array is five. So let's check. You can see this is five. Another thing we can do is instead of having a child array, we can represent the child array by the numbers so we can have something like this we can remove this line and here instead of having a child array we can have something like a parent array which is numbers and we pass the index to it instead of having something like this so we can pass everything here here because this and the child array is the same thing so you have this with dollar i so instead of writing dollar child here also, you can also write everything here should be dollar number, dollar i. So we have dollar i, dollar j. So let's check our browser. So you can see that we are having the same results.
So this is how to loop through a multidimensional array in the first form. In this tutorial, I'll be talking about the second form of multidimensional array. In this form, we have both the parent and child to be associative array. For example, we have an array that represents the ages of students in a class. So we have dollar ages to be array. So you have a key. The first key is male. And this is pointing to another array, another associative array. So we have array. And the key here is we have something like a maker who is 14 years old. We also have Wale who is 13 years old. We also have Musa who is 12 years old. And the second key is female which has value which is also an associative array so you have your key you have Amaka she is 12 years old we have Aisha she's 11 years old and we also have Bisola. She is 10 years old. So, and you close this array here. So, this associative array has values that are also associative array. Now, let us try to get elements in the array. For example, to get the age of Emeka, we will be coming from the parent array through this key, which is male, and through the key here, which is Emeka. Then we can access this value. And also, for the age of Bisola, we will be moving through this key and also through this key. So let's try to write it down. To get the value for Emeka, it's going to be dollar ages So the key for Emeka, the first key is male. This is going to represent another associative array. And to get the value of Emeka, now we have Emeka A. And to get the age of Bisola, it should be something like ages. In our case, is a female of female. And this is an associative array. We have Bisola. So with this, you can guess the actual age of Bisola because everything here is an associative array. And with this, you can get the actual value. In the next tutorial, we will be playing with this in our IDE. ID, but in this case, we need two associative arrays. One as parent and the other as child. So we can remove everything here. So we have dollar ages. which is same thing as array and the first key is male so this is pointing to another array 
So we have a maker and the value of this is 14. We also have Wally and the value of this is 13. And we also have Musa and the value of this is 12. So this is the first item in the array. The second element we have female which is pointing to another associative array. So we have array. We have a marker here. And this is also pointing to 12. We have Aisha. This is pointing to 11. And finally, we have Bisola. So let's make this a capital letter. So this is pointing to 10. So this is our associative array inside another associative array. So finally, we need to add a semicolon here to end a statement. So let us print some of the edges. So we have echo, dollar edges. Let's print the age of a maker. So this is with male. And everything here is also an associative array. So you have to pass another key for a maker. So let's check the value. If I refresh, we have 14. As you can see, the age of a maker is 14. So you can also change this to maybe like Musa. This should be 12. Okay. And for this, for the female, so you can pick female and pick Aisha here. So this should be 11. That's 11. So this is how to get values in multidimensional array that falls under form 2. In this tutorial, we are looking through a multidimensional array that falls in form 2. We know from previous class that to loop through an associative array, we need to use for each statement. So let us comment this. So we have something like for each, we have the parent array, which is dollar ages, as key pointing to a value. With this expression, the first value will be everything in this array, and the second value will be this array. So, but this array, which is value, is also an associative array. Let's do it a step after the other. So, we have our child array equals to dollar value. So, this is the child array equals to dollar value because value is everything here. And this is our child array. So, we also need to look through the child array. Because it is also associative array, we have to use for each also. So you have something like this, for each. Our child array. As in this case, since we've used the like key here, you have to use another thing. So let's use something like dollar child key. 
pointing to dollar child value. So we have something like this. So this value can get each of the elements in the array. And dollar child key is each of the key in the array. So you can echo. Maybe you like to echo dollar child key. So let's add an empty space. And we can also add the value. We have child value something like this so let's check the result in our browser so refresh so you can see what everything is together let us add another break as we did in the previous tutorial so you can have something like this echo we are here okay and also we can add a, an empty space here also so that we can differentiate the values for the same child so let's refresh so you have something like this we make a 14 or 13 or something like that so this is how to look through a multi-dimensional array that falls in form 2 tutorial I'll be talking about the third form of multi-dimensional array in this case we have the parent to be an index array and the child is an associative array for example if you have array students Which is same thing as array and each element is also an array we have array and the name is assuming you have this to be wally this is pointing to 12 we also have aisha pointing to 10 something like this and you have another array you have a marker pointing to 13 you have a maker pointing to 14 we also have another student as we have something like Musa pointing to 15 so this is the closure for this so you can see that these elements are index array the index of this is 0 and the index of this is 1 but the value is also an associative array and this is also an associative array also I mean the second one so how do we get each of the elements in this array? To get the elements, we have the parent and child. So to get each of the elements, for example, the age of Wally is going to be dollar student. Since the parent is index array, you have the index will be zero and the second one is associative array you have wally here so to get the age of amaka also you have dollar student amaka falls under index one so you have amaka here In the next tutorial, let us write this in our IDE.
In this tutorial, I'll be writing some codes on Form 3. So I can remove everything here. So I have array students, which is array of So the parent array is an index array and the child array is an associative array. So I have something like this. You can have Wally pointing to Sol. I can have Aisha pointing to 14. And also, maybe something like Musa pointing to 15. So this is the first element. And the second element is also an associative array. You can have something like a maker. This is pointing to 13. You can also have a marker. This is pointing to 10. You can also have something like Bisola. And this is pointing to 14. So we have two elements in the array. So we have semicolon. So to get elements in the array, I have echo dollar students so the first key is going to be zero because this is index array this is zero this is one and the second one will be the key any of the keys here you have wally uh, you have this so let's check the value. So this is 12 for Wally. So you can change it to a maker. In that case, the first key here has to be 1. So let us refresh. So we have 13. So with this, you can get access to any of the elements in the array. In this tutorial, I'll be looking through an array in the third form. So assuming you have an array like this, you can look through all the elements in the array. So let us remove this. So we know that the parent array is index and the child array is associative. So for the index, you have four dollar i starting from zero dollar i is less than the count or the parent array, which is dollar students, and we have dollar i plus plus. Here we can get the child array, which will be equivalent to dollar student, which is an index array with dollar i. And the first time this will be zero, the second time it will be one, and it continues like that, depending on the length of the array. So you have this, but this child is an associative array, so we'll be having for each loop. We have dollar child as since we don't have any previous key we can use key pointing to dollar value and with this you can get each item in the child array so you can have something like echo dollar key and let's put 
and we can have a space and we have dollar value and to make it easier to read we have echo the break statement here so you have something like this so let's check the result in the browser So you have to refresh. So we have Wale, Aisha, and so on like that. We can add another space here. Something like this. So we have this. So this is how to loop through an array in the third form. So you have to remove everything here. So you have dollar ages equals to array. So the first key is mail, which is pointing to an index array. You have array. You have two. Four, six, eight. We have a comma. We also have female, and this is also pointing to an array. As we have three, six, and nine. So we need to have a semicolon here. So to get the elements, as we want to get the value of eight. So we have ages. The first key is male, and the second key is zero, one, two, three. So this is three. So let's echo this. So let's check the browser. You can see the value is eight. And this is it. So to get the value of six, so this is going to be female, and this is zero one. So this has to be one. So let us refresh. Okay, so this is six. So with this, you can get any item in the array. In this tutorial, I'll be talking about Form 4 of Multidimensional Array. In this case, we have the parent to be associative array and the child to be an index array. For example, if you have dollar ages which is something as an array of so you have this to be male and this is pointed to an index array 2, 4, 6, 8 so you also have another one which is female and the value here also is an index array so you have something like this. To get access to elements in the array, for example, to get the value of 4, it will be something like dollar ages. The key is male. And everything here is an index array. So you have the value. This is 0, 1, 2, 3. So the key is 1. To get access to this, we have dollar ages. This is female. And 
and you have this is zero one two so this is two so let us write this in the id and check the values in this tutorial i'll be looking through array in this form i mean form four wherein the parent array is an associative array and the child array is an index array so we have something like this for the parent array which is associative array we have for each so we have for each dollar ages as we have dollar key pointing to dollar value so each of the value is an index array so you can have something like this our child the same thing as dollar value but to get each element in dollar child we need to use a for loop because it is an index array so you have dollar i since we don't use dollar i before we can use dollar i dollar i is starting from zero dollar i is less than the count of dollar child and we have dollar i plus plus so to get each of the item we have echo dollar child with the index which is dollar i so with this you can get each of the items and if you like you can add a break here and we have something like this and here and have a break tag okay so let's check this in our browser so we're able to get each of the items in the array and instead of using dollar child you can also replace it with dollar value so this will be dollar value and this will be dollar value so it should, it should. so it should see so it will still be the same thing so if i refresh they have the same values also In this tutorial, I'll be telling you a general statement about multidimensional arrays. You should have noticed that in our previous examples, we always have a multidimensional array of two steps. And this is what I mean. We always have a parent and child. But actually, we can have more than these two levels. This child can also have another child. Maybe this is a sub child. And this can also have another sub. Let's call this sub sub child. And this can continue depending on the depth of the multi dimensional array. But one good news is that a mastery of the four forms we discussed. In our previous tutorial, we assist you in solving any multidimensional array problems. Let us take a look at this multidimensional array of three levels. You can see this is the first level, this is the second level, and this is the third level. You will see that the first level is associative array, the second level is also associative array and the third level is index array 
to loop through all the elements in the array in this sub child we'll be having something like this is for each this is another for each because it is associative and this is index array this is for loop so let us try to write this code in our IDE this is our IDE we already have the array here, it's the array of results. This is 100 level, 200 level, and these are the courses. This is an associative array, this is an associative array, and this is index array. For the two associative array, we have for each loop. We have for each dollar result as we have dollar key pointing to dollar value so here we can get our child array our child array is equivalent to dollar value so it means you can get the arrays here so this is also a multi-dimensional array to get the courses so you also have another for each so our array is now child as so let us use something like child key pointing to the like child value so here you can get a dollar sub child which is equivalent to dollar child value so which is this array so this array is an index array so to get each of the elements we will be having a for loop we have for dollar add equals to zero dollar i is less than the count of a sub child we have dollar i plus plus and here we can print the elements in this array so you can have something like echo dollar sub child with the index which is dollar i so we can have a space something like this and after this we can put a break here as we did in previous tutorials so we have br and after this also we can also put a break We have br. So now let us check the results on the browser. So we have this. Let's check the results. So this is the result. We have this for this array here for maths 101, this is chemistry 101, and this is physics 101. And we also have for this course is MTH201 which is this so this is how to look through all the elements in this array so you can have questions in different formats for example you can be told to find the highest score in MTH101 so all you have to do is to get this array and find the maximum number in this array so you can just play around with this array to have a very good understanding of multidimensional array.